so hopefully at least the session is going to be fun. Um, it's something I'm very passionate about, is building bad systems, and I hope some of that passion is going to come through and energize the room a little bit. I might need it more than you as well. So who am I, and why am I qualified to talk to you about building bad systems? Uh, this, this might seem like a bit of a brag, but I, I am the world's okayest programmer. <laughs> There's three things I hate about that mug. Uh, the first is that the font is dangerously close to Comic Sans. Kidding, I like that. Uh, the second is that the A in program is tilted ever so slightly to the side just to trigger my OCD. And then the third thing is that the mug is actually unverified. So even though I'm in possession of the mug, it does not confer upon me official title of world's OKS programmer. I went searching my company Slack to see if I could find some more evidence that would help. Um, I found these messages from some of my colleagues. So maybe that helps. But what does being OK mean? Um, being OK just means I've done some really bad systems before, and I've also done some really good ones before, right? But I'm sure everyone here feels like they've done some bad systems in the past. Is anyone here feel like they've never made an architectural mistake and has always made a perfect system? Let me check behind the pillar. Okay. Right, everyone feels like they've made... Oh, my God. <laughs> I take it back. Almost everyone feels like they've made mistakes. So what do I bring that kind of pushes it over the top? And that's got to do with who I work for. So I work for a company called Particular Software. And Particular Software, we make End Service Bus, which is a framework and set of libraries within .NET to uh, help developers implement microservices and to distribute their systems. And the thing with Particular is, if you work on the engineering team, you work on the support team. And I've been there for six years, and I've done a lot of support. And I've seen a lot of systems, a lot of different scales, a lot of different sizes and different domains. But now, support is an interesting thing. Because if, if we look at the distribution of what you would expect system quality to follow, you might think it would be a normal curve, where you've got some really bad systems on the one side and some really good systems on the other, and then a whole lot of good ones in the middle. But if you're doing support, you don't get the guys where everything's going well. No one comes to you and says, hey, things are going great. How can we make it bad? I mean, they should, but they don't. So I get to see all the people down here where things are bad, think they need help, and as far as I'm concerned, the distribution of system quality isn't a normal distribution. It actually looks like this. And there are no good systems. Everything is bad. And we should be ashamed as an industry of what we're doing to our customers. <laughs> so let's talk about why we would want to do microservices. Um, you can't really see this. I'm very sorry. The projectors are a little bit small. But someone asked on Reddit why you do microservices, what problem you're trying to solve. And some of the answers are absolute perfection. Uh, they want to solve their broken heart, uh, increase complexity, and decrease performance. Um, they're, they're trying to figure out the most confusing way to create a web application. It's all perfect answers here. The consultant answer that I'm supposed to tell you is that we do microservices because once you've achieved good separation of your boundaries, you can then access things like independent deployability, scalability, separation of, of concerns. But that's not at all what we want to do here. Uh, by the way, this picture, uh, this is of the Kailash Temple in India, and I've probably pronounced that very badly. It is carved out of a single rock, so that makes this the largest man-made monolithic structure on Earth. Um, here's a better picture of it. You can sort of see the scale there. There's people walking down in the bottom left. And you just got to look, you could imagine how did they carve this with their bare hands, and obviously not with their bare hands. They probably had chisels. I don't think they were clawing away at the rock. <laughs> But the planning involved in choosing just the right amount of rock away to get this beautiful design, it's amazing. Monoliths can be beautiful. And unfortunately, we tend to use them as swear words in our industry. We call them big balls of mud. I suppose rock is very hard mud. But monoliths can be good. So we're going to start with the monolith. I'm going to assume for the rest of the talk that we have a monolith, and things are going too well, too easy in this monolith, and we want to make it really bad. <laughs> so we're going to introduce microservices. A common technique for when you want to transition a monolith to microservices is you carve off a bit of functionality, you take that functionality, put it in a service somewhere, and then your main monolith can call that process. This is what's known as the strangler pattern, and it's, like I said, a very common technique to actually uh, transition monoliths into microservices. But what happens when we do this? So let's take a look at the load of the system on the x-axis and how that impacts the throughput of the system on the y-axis. We're going to look at the monolith of the first, and then we're going to see what transition into microservices does to the throughput of your system, to the overall capacity. 
So as your, the load of your system increases on the monolith, you might expect the throughput to increase at a fairly linear rate. It's not going to be a one-to-one. -one. There will be some K factor that will increase by. But especially at low load, the increase will be fairly linear. Eventually, you get more load in your system, and the, the rate of change of increased throughput decreases a little bit. And that's just because there's contention of resources. Maybe there's some database locks you've got, or your threads are hanging around a little bit longer, and there's doing more context switching. The, the rate of throughput will decrease. Until you get to a point where you bump the load up so high that the throughput of your system plummets. Now, why does this happen? So predominantly, this is to do with operating system resources. And I'm going to talk specifically in the .NET space, because that's what I know. But a lot of this applies to other languages and environments as well. So in .NET, there's three types of garbage collection events that would trigger something like this. The first is a generation zero garbage collection event, then generation one, and generation two. Gen zero garbage collection events are in intended to release objects that are created and then re returned back to the memory pool very quickly. So think of a variable that you, that you assign in a local function, and then it gets uh, out of scope and can be cleaned up very quickly. If a gen zero garbage collection cycle runs, and it tries to release an object, but it can't because it's still being referenced, it promotes that object to gen one, because it thinks, OK, you're still using this. This is important. You can keep it around a little bit longer. When a gen one garbage collection event runs, it goes through all of the objects and tries to release them again. And if it can't, that again gets promoted to generation two. And that's where we get into the problem. Generation two garbage collection is very invasive. 10, 15 years ago, uh, Gen 2 garbage collection used to suspend all user threads. So your entire application got paused while a Gen 2 garbage collection event was happening. Stack Overflow experienced this. The Mark Gravel from Stack Overflow, there's a link at the end of the presentation to, uh, to the blog post. Um, he explained why Stack Overflow experienced this, the impact of Gen 2 garbage collection, and how they resolved it, where you get these massive spikes where there's almost no throughput going through their system. It's much better now. The Gen 2 garbage collection events don't suspend all the threads for the entire duration. It suspends, then resumes, then does a bit of other work, then suspends again and resumes. But it's still a fairly invasive process that has to happen. So now that we've introduced microservices, what happens? Right. As the load of our new microservice system increases, you would expect the throughput to also increase. It should be obvious that the increase in throughput will be less than the monolith, because now we've introduced a network hop, right? Network hops are expensive. Now, what does that mean with expensive network hops? It means that threads are staying around longer. You're holding on to things for longer, which means you get promoted to Gen 2 even sooner, which means you get the drop off faster. So this is a good first step. We can make our system really bad by just splitting everything out and putting a network call in front of it. And that's the first guaranteed technique to make your system awful. If you apply the strangler pattern everywhere in your system, you are more quite likely going to hurt the capacity of your system, the overall capacity. Now, that's not necessarily always true. For instance, if the charge credit card method was on the hot path, there was a lot of CPU uh, instructions going on there. If you extracted that out on its own, you could scale that independently, and then you, you would free up additional resources in your main process. But we're not going to do that. We're going to apply it indiscriminately and distribute our entire monolith like this. So we've now got our monolith. That's now distributed. It's microserviced. Yeah. Except now, we haven't actually changed anything. We've still got the same coupling. There's still a lot of tight coupling between the function calls, except they're not functions now. They're network calls, so we've now introduced network topology coupling. Good job. And in fact, this is still just a monolith. It's just a distributed monolith, or what we sometimes call a distributed ball of mud. So this is difficult. We don't want to work in this. Our team is angry with us. But we're pretty set on, on making the worst system possible, so we're going to continue down this path. And you might think to yourself one day, you know, I bet you I could rewrite this whole thing in two months. Anybody thought that? <laughs> Is anybody busy with a rewrite right now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Big Bang rewrites do not work. OK, uh, asterisk, because there's a couple caveats to that. We'll get to those caveats just now. But Big Bang rewrites are enticing uh, but they don't really work very well. And the reason for that is because of how software development works. As you work on a system, you spend a certain amount of time implementing features and functionality within a system. So X amount of time gets you Y amount of features. As the system gets larger, it takes more time to introduce the same set of features. So the rate of change of functionality that you can add 
decreases. So it is going to drop off. And eventually you're going to get to the point where it feels like you're adding no functionality, but the time you spend to do so is intense. So you think, right, we'll rewrite the system, it'll be great. Now if we chose that second inflection point, where, we, where, the, where the rate of change increases very slowly, and we said we're going to do the rewrite from here, it means that that little sliver of functionality we would have added doesn't exist anymore, and instead the team that's working on the rewrite is now building a new system from scratch. And the reason that it seems like this might be a good idea is because we always think it'll only take two months. We're really good at estimating things. We can story point everything, that'll be fantastic. <laughs> so we're gonna rewrite the system and initially, because of the way software development works, we might feel like we've got high velocity, we're adding a lot of functionality in a really quick time and we'll catch up super fast. But we're not really going to. <laughs> So we're going to have our distributed monolith on the side, and business is going to come to us and say, listen, you haven't added any new features to this thing for a really long time. I know you're busy with the rewrite, but I'm a bit sick of this. So either you ship your rewrite now, or we can the whole thing. And you start panicking, you think, OK. Um, I know what we'll do. We'll ship the new code base for the new functionality we've replaced. And then the users can use the old system at the same time, and we'll just fix bugs in there, and then we'll slowly add more functionality to the new system, right? And then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll keep them running in production at the same time, and to make sure that everything's in sync, we'll have an integration layer between the two. And we know the integration layer is going to suck because the monolith sucks, and that's going to bleed over into there. And because we're also doing things the right way now, we're going to start with services on this side, and it's going to be great. So we're going to have a bunch of different code bases we're going to support and achieve very little for our customers. Good job. So the second fail technique you can use is to try to do a big bang rewrite all at once. Uh, now, I did say asterisk. Let's get back to that. Big bang rewrites do not work, except in two cases. The first is if your scope is so tightly constrained that every single part of your system is 100% documented that you know you can do it before business gets annoyed and you don't have to do a side-by-side -side production run. The second time it works is for your CV, so you can get new technology on your CV and then you can leave. Um, it doesn't work for the product, but it works great for your career, so top tip, you can use that. So this is what our system looks like. We, we're hating ourselves now. This is pretty bad. We're crawling along in terms of delivering value to our business. And it's looking good. Um, but remember when we, when we experienced this big drop off in performance and why that was? It's because our process A was uh, waiting for a response from the charge credit card call. Now, we don't want to be maliciously bad and make bad systems on purpose. We want to do it uh, while trying to make good systems. So what we'll do is, instead of having our service call our new credit card service and wait for a response, that's no good, we're going to get in the same situation there, we're rather going to introduce a queue in our credit card service. So our service A can just put a message on the queue. Once the message is on the queue, it can terminate, right? And then everything's fine. That's not going to be a Gen 2 event. Our credit card service can go ahead and process things as it needs to. So it can call Swift or PayFast or Peach or Valor, whichever sponsor you like the most. It can call that service, um, and when the message gets to the front of the queue, everything's fine, right? It looks great until things start going wrong. Because um, I don't write bugs, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes things don't work. So we call the credit card service and an exception happens, or the payment service, something goes wrong. Now we've taken the message off of the queue, and we go, oops, Oh, well, we'll log something, and then the message disappears. So now we've got a bad system that's performing poorly, and we're also losing money for our customers. That's, that's rude. Like, I, I draw the line at losing money. I'm OK with making their lives miserable. So how can we prevent this? We start thinking, well, what we need to do is when we take the message off the queue, we'll do it in a try-catch. And then we'll do that in a loop, right? And then we'll just keep processing until it successfully uh, gets processed. Great. Except now our poor sponsors' web services are getting hammered because we're making thousands and thousands and thousands of calls, calls the whole time while we're trying to process this poor message. We want to be nice to them, so we also think, okay, um, if something fails five times, maybe we'll back off for five seconds. If it fails again, we'll back off for... How far back can I go? We'll back off for another minute. I'm going to be careful here. And eventually we start building some complex exponential back-off logic within our, our try-catch-retry loop that we have to then maintain. And it's looking good. 
Um, but some messages will never ever be processed because one of you have written a bug somewhere, not me of course, um, and the message is sitting at the front of the queue. We're trying to process it, but it's never ever going to succeed. Maybe there's a bug in our code, maybe it's in Swift's code, maybe there's some bad data on the message, and we can never actually successfully process that message until we fix it. Now this message is sitting at the front of the queue, meaning all the other messages behind it aren't being processed, so we think to ourselves, okay, easy fix, I've heard of a DL queue, we'll just introduce another queue, take the message, move it to that queue, and everything's fine. And then now we have to write some more code to manage that queue, and it's looking good. We're basically our own product owners here for an infrastructure tool that our business didn't ask for, and we're doing great. So here's the thing. They are off-the-shelf frameworks that do this. Now, um, N-Service Bus is one, but please don't think that I'm saying you have to go out and use N-Service Bus. Uh, there are open source free ones that do it in whatever language you want, Mass Transit, Rebus, Brighter Command. A lot of this infrastructure work, hand it off. No, don't hand it off. Do it yourself. Do it yourself. Don't hand it off to them. Make things bad. So at this stage, we're managing our own infrastructure code, we've got our, our services we're managing, we've got our horrible integration layer, and we're fixing bugs in our distributed monolith. We're practically not doing anything. Our business value, our story point velocity is really low, except for all the infrastructure stuff we're doing. But we can make it worse. So to do that, let's look at a specific product, or service, sorry. So we'll look at the product service, right? Maybe we are an e-commerce site called Take A Many, and we, we want to allow people to search and buy products online. So we'll create a product service. That sounds reasonable. What would belong in a product service? Well, obviously the name, maybe the price. We'll have something about the pictures of the product. Whether it's in stock, that could work. Uh, a description of the product, maybe some reviews. Sounds sort of reasonable. And we end up with a class that represents our product like this, with an ID, name, description, price, rating, images, whether it's in stock or not, or where it's in stock. And we can take this and implement a search screen, right? Our customers can search for something, and then based on the keywords they search for, we can show them different products that match. And we haven't had to cross system boundaries or service boundaries, so we've high-fived ourselves, congratulations, we've done the best service ident boundary identification ever. And then our business comes to us and says, hey, we've got a great idea. Does anybody else get PTSD when the business comes in with new ideas, right? So the eyes start switching a little bit, and they say, we've got a theory that if someone has ordered something beforehand, and it's a consumable, they will pr probably order the same thing. So we want to add a, a little flag on the search screen showing whether or not someone has ordered this product before. And you think, oh, okay, that's, that's in the order service. Um, okay, business, do you promise that this is only gonna be the one time that we're gonna have to go outside of our service boundaries? <laughs> Right, and they're going to pinky promise, uh, so you're going to compromise and have the order service as part of your product service tightly coupled together in your search screen. And then business comes to you and says, hey, and the eye starts twitching, you reach for the blood pressure medication. It would sure be great if we could introduce some type of customer status, because some customers get a really big discount based on their status. And you just, at this stage, you give up and you, you, you tightly couple everything together and you introduce other services into your search screen. Now, search is a very easy example to show why this is going to be difficult because search sort of, it's you're searching for something that's typically across a lot of what you would consider boundaries. And you end up with systems that look a bit like this. Has anyone seen this video? Okay, if you haven't, there's a link at the end of the presentation, but it's on YouTube, it's called Microservices, it's like three minutes, and it's, it's a parody, it's absolutely hilarious, and I cry every time I watch it because it's so true, and it breaks my heart. So what we've done is we've taken a product service, a customer service, an order service, and defined them as their own things, right? It sounds like reasonable boundaries for your service. And there's coupling now on our search screen because we thought it was a good idea to have the boundaries defined like that. But the thing is, when we present a product to a user, what we're presenting to them isn't necessarily a product on its own. A product that we present on the screen can be a combination of different data that comes from different places. For instance, is the price of the product really something that defines what the product is? 
Maybe not. Has anyone heard of anti-requirements? Okay, so anti-requirements is a technique you can use to find out if you actually do have coupling within your service boundary or not. So you can ask a question like, if I fix a spelling mistake on the name of the product, is it going to impact the price? Probably not. I mean, maybe. You, you pay more for price or products that are spelled cor correctly, but it's likely not going to actually change the, pri uh, the price of the product. Maybe if there was a rebranding event, they would change the pricing model associated with it, but that's not you know, just changing the name. So the price and the name and the description of the product probably aren't linked. The description of the name might be because there's a high chance that the name of the product will also be in the description. So you've got sort of coupling there. And what you tend to find is that the easy domain models, the ones that sort of jump out to you, are actually not the domain models that are interesting. Has anyone read Chris Evans's, not Chris Evans, Eric Evans's DDD book? Obviously, we don't read Captain America's DDD book, we read author's DDD books. So one of the things he says here is that the, you don't need a domain model for everything. You don't need a well-defined service boundary for everything. Something as simple as a product doesn't really have any interesting components with it. The product on its own is just a few boring fields. The interesting bits are the overlaps between these nouns. So when you're defining your service boundaries, a good technique to get it wrong is to make sure that you define your service boundaries based off of nouns and not verbs, things that you can touch. It's almost guaranteed to be wrong. Uh, does anyone got entirely noun-based services here? Anyone going to admit to it? Claims, policies, things like that? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so we've now got our distributed monolith, we've got our horrible integration layer that we have to maintain, we've got these services that we've tightly coupled, we've got this janky custom code that we're also maintaining along the way. We're absolutely doing nothing for our users. But we, we kind of want to make the search thing better, right? We want to get rid of some of that coupling because it's not, it's not nice to have to work with. So we sort of take a moment and we think, well, how can we make this better? If our search screen is like this and we've got this tight coupling between the things, maybe what we should do is, hmm, I know, we'll introduce a search service, right? To search is a noun, so that's, no, it's a verb, sorry, wow. To search is a verb, so it's not a noun. We're doing good things here. It's only going to get better. Um, and what we'll do is we'll have a, a dedicated search database. That makes sense, right? And, and we'll, we'll just keep a list of a small subset of the products and we'll subscribe to mess events from the product service. And whenever a new product is added or whenever product price is changed, we'll update our database. Um, and then we'll do the same for customers, right? We'll have a little customer thing that's just the ID and their status. And when the status of a customer changes, we'll subscribe and, right? You know, it's great, we, we're, we're fixing this. Now when we search, you only have to search in the search service. That's a one boundary thing, right? Except you've still got some incredibly tight coupling here. And you've just hidden it by the fact that you're duplicating the data in a separate boundary. If the customer service, instead of having customer status as an enum, they change it to a, a float. A customer status is a value between zero and 100, or zero and one you then have to change the, the topology of the search database that you're using because there's, there's that tight coupling between the two services. So just having a separate search service with its own database isn't actually going to solve any of the problems here. Has anyone tried this technique, by the way? If, if you have, yeah, keep at it. <laughs> but we can, okay, I'm going to take a quick detour here and I'm going to show you a technique you can use that'll make this a bit better for you. Now, I don't want you to actually go and apply this technique anywhere. Um, I'm only showing you this technique so that if you ever find yourself doing it accidentally, you can recognize that and stop because um, we don't actually want to improve things. So, if our search was in a monolith, right? Monolithic searches are easy because if it's in process, our product context, our product service just provides a list of products that, meets this, that match the search filter. Our customer service can then in memory go and apply whatever status it has to those prices and our order service can go and mark which of those the person has ordered beforehand. Within the boundary of a single system, this is easy. And in fact, if this was a monolith, the chances of this all being in the same database is very high, which means you could do this with a single SQL query. Can we take some of those benefits and apply it in a distributed model? Yes, thankfully. Um, 
so rather than having a search service, we'll have a search engine because it's not a service boundary. A search is something you do. You're, you're not, there's no real clever business logic there, right? And what our search engine does is it's going to be deployed in its own app domain or its own process. It's going to be its own little microservice. I hate the new word service. It's so overloaded in our industry. But we're going to deploy it as its own little app domain, its own process that it's, that it's going to run. And it's going to process all the search information for us. All it has to do is expose three interfaces for this use case. The first interface is I find products. Second is I price products. And then the third is I track orders. So the first one, obviously, just you pass it, you call that function, pass it in some text, and it gives you all the products that match, right? I price products, it gives you the price of a product, uh, maybe the discount factor based off of the user status or something like that, and whether or not the person has ordered the product before. So the search engine defines these interfaces, and each of these services can implement their own versions of whatever interfaces they are applicable to. So the product service could implement a product finder class. The customer service could implement a status pricer class, something that looks at the user status and returns a discount factor or something based off of the customer status. And the order service can do the same for an order history class. But now we've got these three separate classes sitting in three separate services, and we've got our search engine at the top. How do we kind of pull this together without introducing coupling? That's the important part here. And the trick to note here is that your logical boundaries of your service do not have to be the same as the deployment, the physical boundaries of your service. You can deploy things separately while still logically being in the same bounded context. So the product finder class could be packaged as a DLL and just placed in the folder of the search engine. And that folder, when the search engine then tries to do a search, it can say, hey, uh, inside my app domain, give me all of the classes that implement I find products. It doesn't know that the product finder class comes from the product service repository. There's no link there. There's no coupling between or from the search engine to the product service. The same with the status pricer. It can just deploy a DLL into the search engine's app domain, and the order history can do the same. All of these three don't know anything about the other parts of the search that form the process of searching. There's no coupling there. They know how to talk to their own database. They know how to connect to their own database. And if there is completely different technology between the different uh, databases that they need to talk to, that's not surfaced anywhere. The interesting thing, though, is that each of these services can implement other versions of the same thing. So we could introduce a daily deal pricer, which also then changes the prices of objects based on a particular date. We could also then do a bulk discount pricer from the order service. So each of these can implement whatever interfaces they have that match what the process of searching needs, but we don't introduce that coupling. None, none of them know that the other exists at all. So if the schema changes in the order service or the customer service, there's nothing that changes in our other services. There's no bleed over there. This is known as the engine pattern. Um, so if you want to look at it, Martin Fowler has got a great uh, post on it, and Gregor Holp also has a fantastic description of the engine pattern. I don't know why it's not used more often in our industry. The key thing that makes this work, though, is that you need to understand that the logical boundary of your service domain is not the same as your physical deployment boundary. We don't do that for other parts of our system. We don't think our GitHub repository is what we ship, right? We ship artifacts from the GitHub repository. So why do we now conflate it when we talk with microservices? This man is clearly walking in front of a barrier and behind him, his shadow is being projected behind the barrier. doesn't mean that he's now suddenly magically in both sides. He's still on the one side of the barrier. So if you want to make things worse, don't do this, and make sure that you conflate your logical and your deployment boundaries as much as you possibly can. It'll be great. So now we sit with our system where we've got our, our distributed monolith, where we're doing absolutely nothing there. We're just sort of fixing bugs as they come up. We've got a horrible integration layer. We've made sure that our services are tightly coupled. We've got a bunch of infrastructure code that we're maintaining, and we actively avoid doing anything uh, that allows us to fix any of these problems. And things are great for career development. I don't know. It's pretty bad for our users. So I hope that um, I'm finished quite early. Sorry about that. But I hope that you, you've uh, had a bit of fun here. I hope that you've learned things that you should 
not do, I don't want to say that, <laughs> that you should not do. Maybe if you're doing this in some of your environments, it's not necessarily going to be bad straight away, but maybe just spend some time thinking about whether or not what you've done um, is appropriate. Maybe there's other ways that you can improve the situation. Um, thank you. Are there any questions? I'm also going to take a look at Slack quickly to see if there's anything there. If you don't, yeah. yeah. Cool. Hey. So, uh, fun fact, we actually recently took over a project where uh, microservices was a distributed monolith. Um, so far, it's great. <laughs> we uh, just have to pull a thousand repos and build each one individually and then run each one individually and then hope they all work. Um, microservices. Microservices. So, my question is, how did we get here? <laughs> like, how did we go from microservices to people being like, let's just build a monolith, but split it into pieces. And then, I mean, we all know it's still a distributed monolith, but people are still okay with it. Like, how did we get to this point where microservices just became, break it into pieces? So the, the interesting thing in our, in our industry is that we sort of repeat cycles every, every 10 to 15 years. Um, so microservices obviously would have come from the original SOA, which would have come from the original object-oriented paradigm. And the reason that we keep reinventing these wheels is because we always get it wrong. Because it, it, I think it's, it's a very easy slope where you think, oh, I'm just going to do this over here and apply this technique here. And you don't, you don't critically question why you're applying that technique all over the place. And with microservices, I think we, we went way too far in the other direction where we even started focusing on the, the length of lines of code within methods. And it, it, became, it became silly. And I blame Netflix and Uber for a lot of it. Um, because of all those pictures of these thousands of services that talk to each other. There's, there's a few customers that I've, that I've worked with where they've actually treated each deployment as, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Not idempotent, but sort of like that, where they deploy an instance of a thing and that lives there forever. It never gets decommissioned. Um, if they need to fix a bug, they ship a new version. And that becomes its own new endpoint thing. And it's, uh, it sounds, wow, that's really mature. They must be doing great, but it's a nightmare. <laughs> Remember, that's why they came to, to ask for help. Um, so I, I think one of, the, one of the reasons that leads to these bad system designs is that we just apply things all over the place without making sure that they make sense for that point in time. Fair enough. And maybe just a follow-up question to that then. With the sort of advent of serverless computing and obviously hosting in the cloud, uh, not as much as a buzzword now as it used to be, mm. But it's still one of those things that I've found that people don't, you kind of need to implement a microservice to make things scale well in the cloud, right? But how do we get to a point where we can do serverless and scalable without making microservice mistakes? Is, is the problem that we need to change how we talk about it? Or is the problem that we need to, as you said, microservices started before cloud? From, from what you've just said, mm. is it just that we need to be like, okay, let's stop chasing microservices and actually just start implementing, like, do we go cloud first? Well, I think that the first thing is to, to, is to not assume that you have to use serverless for everything. Like, it, it's got a, a lot of media momentum behind it. There's a lot of hype behind it. But it doesn't always make sense. Um, if you, serverless is triggered based off of other things happening around you, so a message coming into a service or an HTTP request coming in or something like that, that isn't necessarily going to be applicable to a lot of use cases that people do. Something like a batch job, you, you might think it's a good idea to have a message sent at a specific time to then wake up your serverless function that's going to do the batch job, and it, it doesn't make sense to do that. Uh, serverless is not intended to be used for everything. It works really well for if you, want, if you have uh, cost models that allow you to take advantage of uh, quick startup, quick shutdown, and then a lot of lag time between. But if you've got a high throughput system, maybe there's other cheaper ways that you can achieve the same sort of scale. So uh, I think the, the same answer applies is if, if you're blindly just to choosing things because that's what you've got now, it's a slippery slope that you're going to end up in a situation where, why have we done this? I can rewrite this in a couple months. Are there any other questions? There's a few in Slack, so while, if someone's thinking of one, um, I don't know if I could 
Uh, read this. Okay, so Stephen Dole says, deploying logical code into another application's app domain means there's configs. Their configs could not become highly coupled and potentially clash where two objects that don't know of each other look to the same config key with different context. Would the engine model require highly coupled, highly coupled config? So you would have to, this, that's a good question. Um, there is a chance that you could have uh, conflicting conflicts. So if, you, if your connection string is an environment variable called connection string, that's probably gonna clash with the other environment that uses the same connection string. Um, so don't do that. Maybe prefix it with the, the logical service boundary. Um, so it'll be product connection string. Um, I don't know if it's highly coupled. I think maybe there's just a chance of contention between the names of things. Yes? that we use actually extensively is decoupling your config deployments from your service deployments because your config mutations are often much more rapid than your business logic deployments. So um, building the or leveraging the ability to inject your, or deploy your service, uh, your config only dynamically um, and injecting that into a service separate from a Go deployment, it makes you much more agile. And I yeah. think that can also be leveraged here. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic point because your config files are typical, or your config configurations are also typically uh, environment specific as well. So uh, the, it, you can leverage a lot of the, the what is it called, Transpilation, transformation between different um, environments. Okay, if that's it. Um, you can catch me outside in the corridors and we can talk about bad software as much as you want. Like I said, I'm very passionate about that. So. Bring it on. Thank you, everyone.